Thank you and welcome to this press conference related to Chesterfield County's fiscal year 22 budget. I'm your public information officer, Jay Elias O'Neill. Here joining us um, on the dais front is Dr. Joe Casey. He is our county administrator. To the right of Dr. Casey is Mr. Matt Harris. He is the Deputy County Administrator of Finance and Administration. And to the left of Dr. Casey is Gerard Durkin. He is our Director of Budget and Management here in Chesterfield County. There's going to be a short presentation and afterwards we'll take questions uh, from the media that is present. Uh, but at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Casey. Well, thank you. And, and welcome everybody. Again, I know we're doing this during a pandemic, so it's not uh, our traditional press briefing of a budget, but uh, we're gonna make our best uh, to inform you uh, and let you know what we are about to do over the course of the next month. Uh, there's much information to present. I have an opening uh, speech, if you will, of about 10 minutes or so, and then I'll be turning it to my two colleagues uh, who have a lot of details with the budget before you. So, it was just about a year ago, I was speaking about an amazing budget before us investing so much for our citizens and schools. All were good, healthy outlooks. We were all aware of this pandemic creeping towards us, but I'd hoped that it would be contained or short in duration, but it has stayed ever since. We don't know when it will leave or what final devastating wake of loved ones lost, struggling students, or financial and mental health despair. As we recognize the severity of the economic challenge early on, our hallmark approach to fiscal stewardship enabled a nimble, creative, and targeted budget last year. We remain committed to delivering high quality services expected by our citizens and have surpassed the challenge with actions that speak louder than words, and essentially, the actions of our employees. I wanna thank our employees to be able to pivot while managing stress, including the 2,300 employees who at some point have worked virtually. Many doing so on what we once called snow closings. The many closely confined throughout their shift wearing facial coverings all day. The continuing bravery of our first responders, our teachers going above and beyond for our children. The 24 seven complex mental health and social services provided. Coverage for the 1000 furloughed and frozen positions over the past year and the coverage over the past year for their fellow 865 employees who had COVID and over 4,000 quarantined at some point. We are blessed that they have made full recoveries. Although I know many of our employees lost family members and friends, so those wounds will be with them forever. Our workforce has demonstrated the most enduring qualities and this budget is an overdue thank you for any employer when longer tenured employees are earning a similar amount as those less tenured, compression and lower employee morale arises. We have taken the word compression out of our vocabulary for public safety sworn personnel and teachers with over 36 million invested. These step-based positions now have a positive slope to them that rewards the tenure and related experience these 6,000 plus employees bring to the job every day. To keep compression from emerging again, our collective efforts will focus upon annual step increases for these positions. We'll be covering other remarkable 5,900 plus county and school employees with a similar independent professional pay study over the next year, while also providing them with an annual salary increase. We have been mindful in allocating any pandemic related federal or state revenues to the citizens and businesses in the most need and take pressure off local revenues so they are positioned to carry out targeted programs and services longer and purposefully. There is still much to do as information becomes available between now and budget adoption, including final state budget and federal COVID relief bill, aligning one-time funding for one-time uses. This pandemic has made us realize the vulnerabilities of many households and small businesses with this budget providing comprehensive revisions to our tax relief and exemption programs totaling 12.5 million. Our 3,000 elderly and disabled citizens have reduced or no re real property tax bills and more will now receive no tax bill. 
Over 14,000 vehicles will join 4,000 existing vehicles to no longer get a car tax bill. And over 400 small businesses will now join over 5,900 other businesses that now will be exempt from business license taxes. And 3,200 other large businesses having reduction in their tax calculation. For our schools, I want to thank the school board in aligning with our revised local target. Having a target-based budget defined enables citizens to see the commitment to schools and know what's in the budget and what may be other needs above target affordability. Our local funding of school operations has been at three times the pace of all other local government over the past 10 years. Even though our growth and related service demands during the same time period is weighted towards more non-student households, which now represent close to 75% of all traditional homes, and this excludes the varied multifamily and townhomes, which generate even less students. This trend is expected to continue as we become a destination for young workers and empty nesters, and for those empty nesters living here, the new empty nesters, that is, that are living here, that continue to call Chesterfield home. In addition, school capital funding has been significant since the 2013 referendum, and with new projects underway, we should be well positioned for $300 million school portion of a 2022 referendum that will build off the 2013 campaign and focus primarily on addressing capacity and building condition needs at the middle school level. School funding will remain a top priority, though meeting any needs-based levels each year above our ability to generate taxes is not feasible for schools or any county departments and in turn require plans and prioritization. My personal and professional opinion is that our current property tax rate structure is at a ceiling and efforts to live within such structure and perhaps in the future with reduced rates can only make Chesterfield an affordable place to live and do business. For county departments, their needs are first presented to me in September, and through continuing refinement of revenue capacity, such needs are prioritized to you today in a balanced budget so that elected officials and the public have a month to understand, discuss, and adjust a balanced budget. I do respect any needs presented to me, such as $4 billion in road project needs disclosed in our budget appendix. But I also don't want this to distract from today's proposal. We are thankful for any funding the state provides to us, but sometimes the headlines of such funding don't translate into what we actually receive. For example, the state often talks about their biennium budget in two-year terms of dollars and raises, which is confusing to those that want to know what's actually happening July 1st. Also, in regard to how they define teacher under their formulas, they only fund a share of state-defined teacher salaries, and we actually have almost 800 additional 100% locally funded teachers with our lower student teacher ratios than state funding formulas. In addition, the state definition of teacher salary is below how we define a teacher salary, and they don't provide any funding for teacher health insurance. If we're ever to approach a national type pay indicator statewide, the state will need to be the driving force financially. The headlines don't also report how the state adversely impacts us financially. Recently, $1.5 million of our recordation taxes we used to initially fund a version of this budget is now going to help fund the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Project. New state initiated tax local relief programs costing us over $6 million a year are funded without one penny from the state. Or that we are housing in our local jail right now 200 inmates sentenced to the state prison system that they have failed to remove, which costs our citizens over $3 million a year. Or that we fund their state constitutional offices for the shortfall the state has in their own formulas and 100% locally fund beyond their antiquated formulas to today's service standards. These are all examples beyond our traditional discussion and frustration regarding unfunded mandates. However, I would be remiss if I also didn't thank the state for the CVTA, the Central Virginia Transportation Authority, 
and our 50% share of locally generated $116.2 million in revenues over five years to have one of the most robust road capital improvement programs ever. I am looking forward to working with our regional friends on the regional project 35% share of revenues that is not in this budget and the ability of GRTC to best utilize 15% share of state revenues to meet the most pressing needs and productive routes of the region without any additional local funds. In regards to other county capital projects, our 150 million share of the 2020, 2022 referendum will enable us to build new fire stations, libraries, parks, roads, and for the first time, police stations as we grow roots with owned and strategically situated stations. I do want to end by thanking the resilience of our citizens and businesses. There are many successful stories that have brought our community together in helping feed and provide shelter to one another. And there are many good economic stories of how we've supported our local businesses, our citizen teleworkers and their increased local purchasing power, which we hope will continue post pandemic. Our voters coming out in record numbers with early voting at our libraries, our strong production related businesses for the many goods needed nationwide, our efforts on diversity to position all of us to know more and act in support of others, and our strong hospital and healthcare system attentive to their patients. But we're not done. We are over 25% of our herd immunity goal with first time doses, one of the highest rates amongst large localities in the state. We're defining for ourselves who we are and where we're going as this budget provides not only for the needs of today, but for the opportunities of tomorrow. I'll now turn it over to Deputy County Administrator Matt Harris, who's been a guiding and respected leader to provide some additional details of what's in the proposed budget. Mr. Harris. Uh, Dr. Casey, and I'm, I'm going to speak primarily to the, the handout. Hopefully, uh, those of you who are joining us here today got a copy of that, and we'll certainly make it available online. I think it helps to just sort of frame up as we sort of dive down uh, through the, the panel of speakers into more and more specificity. But I think the first thing to remember is this 22 budget is a, a unique animal in terms of the way that uh, it was put together. You know, in this room a year ago, you know, we were in a different place economically. All of that came back out from, from the original county administrator's proposed budget a year ago. That, that number was reduced by over $50 million you know, by the time that the board ultimately uh, weighed in on it in April. So you're going to see the increases, whether percentage terms or raw dollars <coughs> for fiscal 22, look larger than normal. But I think if you think about it in really two pieces, representing uh, not only what would be normal budget growth for fiscal 22, but going back and picking up um, some of the amendments that were made as during the fiscal 21 process, which we did largely in November and December, the end of tail end of calendar year 2020, and, uh, and some other economic growth in the, the final six months of that year. If you think of it as a two-year increase at you know, a little over 11%, it, it helps to put that in more context. You, you're not going to see, if you look back at the county's history, 11% increase in the overall budget. But when you get thinking of it in the proper context, I think helps put that uh, you know, in, in a much better place and just understand that differently. So that's, a, that's an important thing to note. As always, uh, you know, I think regardless of what press briefing you attend, you see almost 80% or 80 cents out of every dollar going into those core functional areas. And that's actually an increase uh, over last year. And it takes a lot to, uh, to actually move that needle, just given the magnitude of dollars we're talking about. And the reason for that, I think Dr. Case did a nice job in his remarks, highlighting the fact that you know we've got to pin this as the, the year of the workforce. The majority of the growth in this plan and the reason that we're you know moving closer to 80 cents on every dollar being invested in public safety, education, and infrastructure is, is a couple of things. First and foremost, it's that uh, the 
putting in those two pay plans. We've been talking about that for the core over a year now. But if you look from a true budget adoption total perspective, it's never been reflected. It wasn't in a year ago, only the study was in. And then, um, so when this is coming forward, you're seeing the school plan and the public safety plan, which almost total $37 million. So you figure if you got an $85 million increase, the bulk of that is going to support those two plans showing up on an annualized basis for the first time. So that kind of, again, a unique feature where we've really walked into the 22 budget over the course of six to eight months and talking about these things in a very deliberate fashion. So a lot of the things you're seeing uh, numerically today, first time you're seeing those numbers, those totals, those changes, but the, the underlying story pieces aren't anything new. It's just the first time they've all been kind of added up, tallied together, and, uh, and shown on one single piece of paper. So uh, in that same vein, I think if you look back, it's the increase in this budget from the amendment that was brought forth uh, to the Board of Supervisors back in December is only right around 7%. Um, so that was largely represented the public safety pay plan that went in sort of mid-year. And again, this is the first time now we're layering on today uh, the education pay plan that's been worked out over the course of the last uh, 30 to 45 days. So of that more recent kind of truer growth in the budget where you've got a $53 million increase since that 21 amendment or you know, which I think largely represents where the 21 budget settles out after, you know, we figure out where COVID is going to leave us. You have two-thirds of that budget growth going to schools, a $33 million increase in the transfer, which is, uh, again, the way the budget's put together. The general government side, the general fund side, only encapsulates the local transfer. There are other state resources and other pieces and parts that schools receive directly. We're sitting here today talking only about the general fund piece and the largest increase, largest component of the increase that we're talking about from 21 to 22, however you want to cut it, is in that schools column. The local transfer, which we've talked about before, but it bears repeating just because of the historic nature of it, $18 million increase in local funds going into the school budget. And that's on the heels of the fall's largest investment in history in the school's major maintenance program and wrapping up the largest uh, referendum, you know, in terms of new and, and major renovations in school's history. So it's been an unprecedented period of investment uh, in schools and in school facilities, uh, nothing like that, uh, you know, on record for the county. I think that's important because we do talk about the change in demographics. And that's absolutely true, where you've got now only about a quarter of uh, traditional homes, single family homes, detached homes, however you want to define it, with a kid living there that attends Chesterfield County Schools. But even though that trend is, is beginning to, uh, has for the last 10 years decreased, we are saying we are diverting money away from the school system, but it's about trying to find that balance, recognizing that you've got, you know, roughly three quarters of your households who don't every day wake up and send a kid to, uh, to Chesterfield County Schools. So how do you strike that balance? And I think this plan at the end of the day does a nice job of that. One of the things that COVID has taught us above, you know, hand sanitizer and all the rest of it is the importance of these, some of these quality of life uh, elements that uh, folks rely on every single day. Libraries, absolutely, I think is a fantastic example of that. It's not just a place where you know, you have stacks of books and computers. I mean, they have turned into, as uh, Dr. Casey mentioned, voting centers. Uh, you know, if there's power outages, people can go there. Uh, you can go and register for, uh, for vaccines. You know, we had folks going in there to, to run their businesses, to do learning pods. So they really turn into a community hub of sorts. And so you see an, a, really a record investment on the library side as part of this plan. Same thing with parks. I think po folks, just general feedback we get from our constituents is, you know, and during COVID, the ability to be able to go outside, find some open space, some green space, walk on a trail, walk on a park, somewhere where you can get out, you can take your mask off, be safe and spatial. It really just sort of reinforced the, uh, something that I think, you know, you take for granted over time. So again, trying to, with part of this budget, make sure that we're investing, particularly on the maintenance side, really one of the largest investments in our parks maintenance workforce so that, you know, we have nice facilities, we need to make sure that we're maintaining them. And again, really just responding to the feedback we've getting on how important um, that is. So you see the, those quality of life components in here, 
particularly around parks and libraries that we haven't done and focused on uh, as much in prior budgets. And I think that's, again, trying to strike that balance of those quality of life elements in addition to, uh, to the core things. Um, one other thing I want to just hit on quickly is the uh, the referendum. There's been a lot of you know back and forth and trying to understand exactly what that plan is. It is our intention as we sit here today to put that on the ballot in November of 2022. So that's you know roughly a year and a half from now. But by by no means by no means does that represent taking a pause on any of our infrastructure work as an overall locality. Uh, there's a lot of work from a planning perspective, just making sure that you can figure out what uh, what those projects are going to be. That's largely underway as part of this budget on the county and school side. And I think there is a, you know, a 90% draft list that uh, there's a, actually a copy of the general government side on the back of the one pager that uh, hopefully everybody has a copy of. Again, that information is out there, and we'll cover that again on Wednesday. And schools is going through the same process, but you got to finalize what that project lineup is. And then you start to work on, you know, a lot of the architecture and engineering work, site selection. There's a lot of effort that it would take leading up to a referendum, and we can invest and dedicate ourselves over the next 18 months to all of those pieces and parts so that when you go into a referendum, that you don't then have a lag on the backside where you say, yeah, we know you approved all of these projects and you're excited to have these facilities in your community, but now we've got 12 months, 18 months worth of due diligence and design and all those things to happen on the backside. So we can get a lot of that type of work done so that uh, if that referendum is approved, we can hit the ground running and, uh, and get those projects delivered even faster. So I think you're seeing the timeline you know, shift a little bit from if you just look at it simply, but I think we're just pre doing a lot of pre-work ahead of a referendum. So, uh, you know, any insinuation that that is going to cause a delay or an impact on any of our capital facilities, I think the way it will work out at the end of the day, really, uh, you won't see that, that lag. And there's, on the county side, we're using this. We have a lot of capital projects that got caught in COVID, got put on pause. We're bringing all those back to life. That's a relatively long list, everything from a, a pet adoption center to uh, the Beulah project, which will be, again, in that quality of life, parks and rec, kind of a community center, community asset, all of those things being brought back to life so that when we go back to the voters, on, at least on the county side and the school side, all of those uh, 2000 referendum projects, 2013 referendum project schools will be open come this fall. We'll finish sort of all of these sandwich projects that we have. So when we go back to those, we have a nice clean slate of everything that you've entrusted us, whether through a referendum or through a subsequent CIP, you know, now is in motion or is completed. And now we are coming to you to ask for these other facilities. So I think that's a, that's a really important distinction. I know we talked about it a little bit, but we continue to get some questions. There seems to be some confusion around that. Uh, the tax relief piece, Dr. Casey touched on, but I think it does bear repeating. This is probably the most comprehensive tax relief package that we've included in a budget in, in quite some time. I just want to touch on the pieces and parts of that, just so that uh, we went through that quickly, but just slowly walk through those. On the small business and business side, we have a business license tax, and how that works is there's a gross receipts threshold such that if your company currently is $300,000 of gross receipts or under, you simply pay a flat fee, and you don't go into the tax rate schedule where you pay on a percentage of that. So what's being proposed is to raise that from 300,000 up to 400,000, such that you've got a, a large group of businesses now that would just be in the fee-based piece, but all businesses now have another $100,000 of their gross receipts that they are not paying on if they are indeed in that rate schedule piece. So we recognize small business in particular will get the bulk of that relief. We know COVID has been a challenge for them. We've done a lot, as Dr. Casey said, with our CARES money, positioning that through grants and other supports to make sure that they are taken care of. And wanted to continue that momentum and that inertia into that budget. So you absolutely see that here. Uh, the tax relief for the elderly, again, we did that a little bit early and kind of you know unpacking this budget over a number of months. We actually did that last meeting so that we can have it in place for tax year 2021 and they don't have to wait another year, but you saw that for the most impacted folks, the 28,500 was the top end number for 100% relief, raised that up to 31,500. You see that reflected here from a budget perspective for the first time. Uh, so we're, again, we wanna make sure we're taking care of our seniors. 
they, the state did make a decision, and you do see it reflected here. So there's another million dollars of tax relief for veterans, specifically related to personal property. And then the fourth leg of the stool, if you will, is going back and something we haven't done in many, many years in the car tax relief, uh, the way that that schedule works. If you have a vehicle that's $1,000 or under, valued $1,000, there isn't a tax. And we're going to raise that up to $1,500. Again, just something that you know needed to be refreshed, very similar, same vein as we did with the tax relief piece. But that offers, there's 14,000 vehicles in that $1,000 to $1,500 range that now will not receive a tax bill. And that's quite often somebody that's got a third car, maybe for, uh, you know, for uh, somebody that's just learning to drive, or maybe a lower income household that has been receiving that bill that now won't. So really, again, targeted tax relief around four or five places, four or five groups that uh, the board has you know, really made a priority. And so again, the broadest package of tax relief that you've, uh, you've seen from us in, in quite some time. Uh, those are all my uh, highlights, and I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to our budget director who's done a uh, fantastic job this year to see if there's any, uh, anything to add. Mr. Durkin. All right, thank you. Um, the only thing I'd like to point out this year is, you know, we've every year we take a long, hard look at all our line items, and this year in particular, we've really drilled down into it. And one of the things that we've really honed in on is efficiencies. And so when departments come to us and they ask for extra resources, we first look at their budgets and identify, you know, do they have existing resources that they can pivot towards those? And this year, you know, the requests that are in the proposed budget without those efficiencies would have been north of $11 million. But working with the departments, we were able to find about $1.9 million of efficiencies that, you know, we don't have to place extra burdens on taxpayers. So we're able to pivot those resources towards enhancing the services that we've um, provided and will continue to provide going forward. Hardest part of this always turn on the mic for me, but we're gonna, there will be a lot more detail on that. I mean, that's a, a very just kind of, you know, one liner on that topic. Wednesday is just transitioning to sort of what's next. Wednesday is our half day work session. We're going to go through uh, and go through a lot of the highlights in much more detail than we did today, but there will be a really good chapter on that efficiency story. And I think the creativity that, uh, you know, the budget folks working with departments to be able to redeploy assets and you know our first question to them as a as a finance staff as an administration is how can you help yourself with whatever it is you're asking for before you come to the county administrator or ultimately to the board and ask for additional resources and i think this year you've seen more of that activity than ever before and uh, we will highlight a lot of those stories i think it's you know because for us it's not just about the increment we sit here today and talk about it's going from 721 to whatever but we really don't take for granted that that $721 million is going to be there, or at least that we have to justify its existence. So I think what you heard Mr. Durkin talk about a little bit is, is that all the due diligence that goes through in evaluating how's that $721 million spent, and you know, should we have we earned it again for another year? So there will be a broader chapter on that for, uh, for Wednesday. But beginning, that's Wednesday, half-day work session starts at 1 o'clock. All those materials uh, are being posted daily. We're adding new things. The full budget document is up there now where you can go look through it. Uh, and then beginning Thursday, we pivot to our uh, live town halls. We'll again, we do Facebook in this room. It's uh, it just is the most effective way. And I think COVID or no COVID, we will always have that as part of our arsenal just because of uh, the amount of interaction and folks that can attend one of those is just you know tenfold what we can get in person. We will go back to in person soon enough, but this year we will stick with the Facebook. So there's one Thursday, there's two next week, and two the following week. They, they, they all do have a name on them in terms of a magisterial district, but certainly want to let the public know, if you can't make your, there's no code word uh, to get in if you're a Dale resident, you can come to any or all of the five um, that you would like to. So there's five opportunities to do that. And they will also be recorded, and that information will be available if you can't do it, uh, you know, at the at the live time. As well, we do have the the blueprint at chessfield.gov address is up 365 days a year. If you just want to ask a question, you don't want to have be on Facebook, whatever it might be, uh, you can always email us at any hour of the day, and we will get you a response very quickly on that. So with that, I think that wraps up uh, my remarks.
And I'll just bring closure to it. So uh, again, the uh, work sessions starting this Wednesday, they will be a regular board meeting, uh, five hours plus possibly. And, and again, we're here to uh, hear all the different manners in which the budget's presented to the board. Uh, the board may have many questions that, that we are responsive to or whoever the person presenting will be responsive to. Uh, again, following the community meetings, uh, March 24th is a public hearing. And again, as we've been doing since last April, we encourage anyone who wants to comment, uh, they can do that online through the online portals and, and they will be set up for such comments. And, and those comments are read by staff. Uh, they're read by the board members themselves uh, going into the meeting. Uh, we will not be taking actions on March 24th. We design the actions of this budget to uh, take place April 7th. And again, that gives the board two weeks. It gives the public two weeks further to uh, opine, understand, uh, help us out. And, and hopefully we'll be positioned to have a balanced budget April 7th. There may be amendments to them, but the budget is balanced today. And therefore, everything that's going to be done changing the budget will also be a balanced change. Uh, and with that, I, I thank you, and, and we can take some questions, I would imagine. All right. Thank you very, thank you very much for that. Um, any questions uh, from uh, members of the media here? Jim McConnell with the Chesterfield Observer. Um, I just was curious where the 75% of households without school children, where is that coming from? Sure. Yeah, so Jim, that, that is a little different statistic, and I think it's a, it's a byproduct of the, of the Stratus work and the aggregation, identification of all of those data sources that we haven't had in the past. Up until now, the way that we've really hopefully said that out loud is using broader census information that says school-aged children, um, and so that, that takes you, I think it's 5 to 19. But you don't necessarily know whether they're in school, not in school, homeschool, whatever it might be. What we specifically have now, or much more detailed information, is Chesterfield students in Chesterfield schools. So that that is the differentiator. That's why you see a little different information on that, a little different. But again, that's that's the kind of information that we're able to glean out of Stratus and use that in, again, not only in capital, but this is when it comes over to the, to the operational, to the programmatic side, to say, you know, we've got to have that broader balance because, you know, the demographics are shifting. Again, we're making a huge investment in schools, but it's how do you round out that equation. And there'll be a, a chapter on Wednesday to kind of show the 10-year history of what that looks like. We've been able to back, go back and, uh, and put that together. And if I could just add one connotation, and again, I think we're going to get better at describing households, because as you know, uh, when we talk about a traditional home, we refer to it as a single family house. You know, SF is, is, is the word, and then we have multifamily and townhomes and other types of housing products out there. So even on ourselves, we've designed ourselves to think that every house that is built, a uh, traditional home, is a single family home. We need to change some of our, our terms and terminology so that we're clearly explained to people. Um, what is a house? And, and, and that number, as I referenced in, in my opening remarks, uh, does not include you know, many of the other types of housing products that are out there, townhomes, multifamily, so forth. Never done this before. Um, how much of that is um, reflective of COVID, or is that, is that seen as a number that's going to go back to some extent? Uh... I mean, I think that's a, a legitimate question, but I think what we're going to show on Wednesday is a 10-year time series. And you can see, COVID or no COVID, there's a clear trend that as households are added, and it's a lot of the factors Dr. Case talked about. It's the fact folks staying here after their kids graduate and, you know, just wanting to make just, you know, not I'm not going to the villages. I'm going to stay you know, in Chesterfield County. So you see that over a 10 year. So I, I, the number may bounce around, it could bounce up next year. But I think, again, looking at the longer trend, it's, it's a clear uh, direction. I, I will add too, you know, the, the census, timing is everything. So probably by this fall, we will have the details, if you will, of the census. Because again, what we have learned through Stratus, this product of ours for demographics is, we know where all the students live. So we can, we can define all the arrays of households where they live. So that, that's a census-based product that is, is an accurate tool annually. All the other households, 
we don't have the details of those who live in the household. So we infer, and it's just through observation and from our interaction, that there are many young single workers now, teleworking, moving down here from other localities and cities where their, their affordability is, is uh, much better down here. And uh, we may have a lot of empty nesters. We have targeted 55 plus communities. All of those things will come out in the census. So we're gonna understand a lot more who is living in those 75% of homes. Any other, any other questions? Okay, so just to Sarah with the Richmond Times Dispatch, I'm going to repeat your question because you're way out there. So talk loud. <laughs> Okay, so, yep. so, for, so just for people at home can understand the question, it was about related to the uh, 95 cents on the 100, wanted to know if the increase, if those taxes are gonna increase because of the valuation of the home. Sure, very fair question. Um, when I refer to the tax rate, and it's no different than how the state has a sales tax rate and an income tax rate, those are the rates. They, all rates are multiplied some, by something called a base for a real property, it's the value of the home. For, for a car, it's the value of a car. In the state, sales tax is multiplied by total sales. For the income tax, it's multiplied by total income. All of those things, bases will inflate over time, just like the cost of goods or services. So, uh, you know, the base times the rate equals the price of the tax bill, and that is varied because, of, you know, the base, not every home goes up by the same amount or down by the same amount. Can I follow up on that? Um, the, uh, do you all find uh, that this, because this assessment increase this year was larger than expected, um, I know that we've talked briefly sort of previously about the, the housing bubble that sort of went poof in 2008 or nine, depending on who you talk to. Are you, are you all confident that the spending that's in this plan and not asking you to speak for schools, but the, the school transfer that funds these pay plans is sustainable long-term? Yeah, no, Jim, it's a good question. I think the answer to that is, is absolutely, that's kind of what opened my remarks, but I've got to think of this as kind of a two-year budget, you know, as, you know, the most simple way to, to think about that. But in terms of the revaluation, to, to Jess's question, yes, the average tax bill is going up, uh, but it's going up by a healthy amount. You know, it's it's not that, you look back at 05, 06, 07, I mean, you got double digit increases. We did pull the rate down that period, but it still couldn't keep up with that, you know, sort of hyperinflation of housing prices. There may be pockets in the nation and you'd read some headlines about, you know, maybe heading back into some of that. But, you know, for us here in, in Central Virginia and Chesterfield specifically, we just aren't seeing that. I mean, I think if we, anywhere when we're, three to four percent on single family traditional homes that's our you know major marker that we keep our eye on you know we feel good about that. anytime it's going to get north of that you're going to see one of two things happen we're either going to pull back on the rate or we're just not going to spend whatever you know it suggests to us is uh, is sitting there and the other just sort of you know financial nuance i know you and i've had this conversation many times that we're talking about a calendar year increase of what we got on the books today. The back end of this budget, which starts January 1st of 2022, our revaluation assumptions are much less. So we are already hedging that, you know, at four or four and a quarter percent increase for this calendar year won't be repeated. So we're able to sustain everything in here on a, on a much, uh, you know, more subdued number uh, a year from now. Any, any other questions? All right. Well, at this moment, we're going to go ahead and close uh, the question and answer section of this press conference. I want to thank these gentlemen here for joining us and uh, letting our residents know about the proposed fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, again, you can go online to view those documents and those budget items yourself at Chester, excuse me, blueprint.chesterfield.gov. You can also Google search it, uh, blueprint.chesterfield.gov. 
Chesterfield County Government VA um, as well. Um, and be on the lookout for those virtual community meetings, which start on Thursday. We'll have more information about that up on our website at chesterfield.gov. From all of us here in Chesterfield County, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.